Hi everyone, welcome to part two of our lecture on autism spectrum disorders. We left off with watching some videos to really highlight some of the important warning signs um, for autism spectrum disorder and kind of give you guys a little bit of a look into what that assessment kind of looks like. Um, I talked a little bit about the ADOS and how it's mostly play-based and this is a lot of the early warning signs and it highlighted what we're looking for. When we're looking at what we can do, um, early intervention is absolutely critical. We know it's always important, but with autism, the prognosis is so much better because we know that if children have language by age five or some type of communication sy system in place for them, um, their overall prognosis, um, especially adaptively, is going to be a lot better. Um, speech and language services are really at the heart of intervention planning and really getting on board with a good speech language pathologist early on to help build a communication system and build skills um, if there's any deficits in that, especially in that social communication piece, that pragmatic language piece. Occupational and physical therapy are also really important, especially because we do see a lot of delays also with fine motor and also gross motor difficulties. Um, early intervention is best, um, is most effective, and the research supports a use through um, an ABA or applied behavioral analysis approach. And this is done through discrete trial training, literally just do this, you get this, um, a pivotal response training. So pivotal response training is done in the context of typical routines like meal times or bath times and providing um, in the moment online feedback um, on um, the expression or non-expression of um, certain skills you want to see and then also on making sure functional routines are in place such as bathing, eating, um, in, additional to, in addition to like communicating. Um, early intervention really needs to be tailored to meet the individual need of the child. Um, you know, you've probably heard people say if you've met one child with autism you've met one child with autism. And that certainly is the case in some, or is, is the case. Um, the unique set of needs across um, social communication and restrictive and repetitive interests are very individualized. So then the programming and early intervention services and treatment planning need to be tailored to meet the individual needs of the child. And as I mentioned, children that have language by age five have a much better prognosis um, overall. So now we'll get into the DSM-5 criteria and how we make these decisions on whether or not somebody meets di the diagnostic thresholds for, um, for diagnosis for an autism spectrum disorder. So the first one is persistent deficits in social communication and social interactions across multiple um, contexts. And the first is this deficit in social emotional reciprocity, which I've kind of mentioned. And this really everything, all the you know most recent research that's coming out um, is showing that this is really the core deficit of autism spectrum disorders, um, this deficit in social emotional reciprocity. And this is ranging from an abnormal social approach to situations and failure of, again, that normal back and forth or to and fro of, com to and fro of conversations. And then also can um, show itself as a reduced sharing of interests, emotions, Affect, um, failure to initiate or respond to social interactions, both positive and positively and negatively. We also see deficits in nonverbal communication used for social interaction. And this is poorly integrated verbal and nonverbal communication. Um, also that prosody of speech, kind of the way we talk. Um, most some, well, some of us more than others, you know, will use our hands or our body and our facial expressions to communicate. But individuals with autism spectrum disorder most times we see deficits in those behaviors. Um, and this also um, has to do with abnormalities in eye contact and body language or in deficit in understanding and using gestures. Um, and then also, again, poorly integrated use of verbal and nonverbal language. So you'll notice that when, if they are using gestures or using their hands to speak or to point, they just kind of seem almost off cadence. Like it's just kind of off key or the rhythm is kind of funny or abnormal. We also see deficits in develop, maintaining, and understanding relationships. And this has to do with difficulties adjusting behaviors to suit various social contexts, to difficulties in imaginative play or making friends, 
to the absence of interest in peers. Um, most kids, um, again, even shy kids, will show some um, interest in caregivers, other kids around them. But kids on the spectrum, we see a lot of this, this difficulty in understanding um, or this difficulty in understanding that other people are there to interact with. Um, and then that's where the imaginative play comes into. So kiddos on the spectrum, when you, they sometimes will play with toys differently, differently or won't play with toys at all. So they'll look at the tiny parts of toys as a part of using as the toy as a whole to engage in some imaginative scene that they haven't, um, something novel and new that they come up with and are really creative. Um, again, these are things that just typically developing or neurotypical children do. Um, or you might see them play with toys in an imaginative way, um, but it seems kind of scripted, like maybe something they've seen on TV or they've seen someone else do before. The severity is based on social, and it's really important we're going to talk about severity ratings. So the severity in the specific, in the specific criterion A um, in social communication and social interactions is based on social communication impairments and restrictive and repetitive um, patterns of behavior. So the second criterion we want to see restrictive repetitive patterns of behavior, interests, or activities as manifested by at least two of these following things. And the first one is stereotyped or repetitive motor movements, use of objects or speech. And this can be, um, you'll, sometimes you'll see children kind of line up or organize toys in a very specific way. Um, echolalia, which is kind of that parroting language, and that can be delayed off, you know, from stuff they've heard off TV. Or it can be, you know, a child, you know, a parent may ask a question and the child will just repeat what they've said. And also the use of idiosyncratic phrases. Um, and idiosyncratic phrases are these made up words that she'll, and all kids, you know, kind of will make up words. Um, but they just sound kind of funny. Like, so for example, instead, I've just some examples that I've seen. Um, instead of calling something steam, they may call it hot rain or a chair is a sitter um, or an umbrella. They'll have like a completely different word to describe it. So idiosyncratic phrases are really these specific nuanced phrases that kids use in the absence of functional language. We also see this insistence on sameness and inflexible adherence to routines or ritualized patterns of verbal and nonverbal behavior. Um, and usually what we'll see is this extra distress at small changes, difficulties with transitions, rigid thinking patterns, um, specific greeting rituals when they're meeting people, needing to take the same route every time or eat the same food every day. And then we have highly restricted fixated interests that are abnormal in intensity or focus. And this is strong attachment to or preoccup preoccup preoccupation with unusual objects. So they may collect or hoard things um, or have excessively circumscribed or per um, perseverative interests. So this is where you see kids that will be, you know, really fixated on trains or dinosaurs or really anything. And if you try to take them or off topic of that, it causes a lot of distress. And that's really important across all of these three things is that when we're talking with parents and getting samples of behavior about these things, what happens if we don't allow them to go the same way? What happens if we change topic? How much distress does this cause? And again, we're looking for impairment. Um, and you'll hear some parents that are like, oh, it's fine. I just make sure that I always give them their food this way or we walk this way or we drive this way or they only can have access to dinosaurs. And that, even though it's not causing the stop child distress, it's creating um, additional patterns and rituals for the family. So we would um, then qualify that also as distress. And then this hyper or hy hyper or hypo, so more or less activity to sensory input or unusual interest in sensory aspects of the environment. Um, this can be an apparent indifference to pain, temperature, um, adverse response to specific sounds or textures, excessively smelling or touching objects in a weird way, um, visual fascination with lights, crinkly objects, shiny objects or movements. And again, the severity rating is based on um, the amount of impairment that we see across this area. 
um, the restricted repetitive patterns of behavior, just like a, a separate severity rating is assigned to the social communication impairment section. So additional criteria, the symptoms must be present during the early developmental period. The DSM-4 outlined it um, a little more specifically and had an age cutoff, and there is not an age cutoff anymore. Um, it's important to note that this impairment or symptoms may not fully manifest until the social dis demands in exceed their limited capabilities. And what this means is that they might, especially for children that are much higher functioning and we don't see having intellectual disability, they're able to adapt. Um, and so once the social demands get too much, like once they enter school or middle school or high school or college, we'll really see the social dis demands exceed their limited capabilities. And that's really when we'll start to see a lot more Im impairment. Um, we know that the symptoms need to cause clinically significant impairment in social, occupational, other important areas of current functioning. So just saying they meet, you know, they meet all those um, kind of check boxes. They check all the box off from criterion A and B. We also need to see impairment. And we want to make sure that these disturbances are not better accounted for by an intellectual disability or a global developmental delay. Um, we know that intellectual disability and ASD do frequently co-occur, although most individuals with an autism spectrum disorder, um, more than half, do not have an intellectual disability. We also know that to make a comorbid diagnosis of ASD and intellectual disability, so both, we really want to look at that social communication piece because the social communication piece is what really tells us, yes, it is also an intellectual disability um, and it should be below that is expected for their general developmental level given their cognitive abilities. So that is really what, you know, the thing is, some of the times the symptoms of ASD can look like a lot of other things. But in order to make two separate diagnoses, so ASD and intellectual disability, we need to focus on the social communication piece because that is not a core diagnostic feature of intellectual disability alone. So specifiers, we've kind of mentioned these already, but these are new to, um, new to the DSM-5, I guess, across all of the neurodevelopmental disorders, we have these spec specifiers. And these specifiers, um, you saw them also when we looked at the DSM-5 criteria for intellectual disability. These um, tell us how severe the impairment is and what's the level of support they need, not how severe the disorder is. It just tells us how much support they need. And this really helps, again, give some good credence to our whole you know, changing conceptualization of developmental disorders from this supports-based model with the idea that with appropriately matched supports, things will get better. Um, specifiers should not be used for eligibility of services. So level one, this means requiring support. And remember here, a specifier is, is assigned to both the persistent deficit in social communication and a social interaction piece, and a specifier is also given to the restrictive and repetitive patterns of behavior, their first, those first two criteria that are needed. And again, the levels could be different depending on the level of support. They might need level one, so requiring support period and the restrictive repetitive patterns of behavior criteria, and maybe they might require level two, which is requiring substantial support in the social communication piece. And level three is requiring very substantial support. So as you can see from these two, again, they're a little bit vague, but again, it's meant to help communicate how much support they need um, in order to access you know, their environment, access social environments, access education, access things at home. Um, and again, I want to just highlight here that the DSM-5 brings three real main changes in the way doctors and therapists diagnose autism spectrum disorder in the United States. So again, the former subtypes of autism, including autistic disorder, Asperger's, and PDD, NOS, are now folded into this broad category of autism spectrum disorders. Um, and I kind of asked you guys to think about why we might want to do that. And the main reason is because among all of these things, they were more similar than they were different. And so to help put our focus more on supports and treatment planning and research for what causes these things, instead of our, you know, kind of arguing, is it PDD, is it Asperger's, is it high-functioning autism, they all follow under this umbrella term. 
But you guys can kind of think that specifically, especially with Asperger's, some people are really married to that term um, because especially it does, it, it carried a connotation of higher functioning um, historically. So people will say, oh, no, I don't have autism, I have Asperger's. And, you know, the thing is when I'm working with families, if, fa if they still want to use that, I think that's absolutely okay. There's no need to go around being the new DSM police. Um, but just making sure, though, that families still understand why it was changed and why they may see the term autism spectrum disorder on paperwork, um, school documents, um, DD waiver information. And it's because that we know that individuals that were previously diagnosed with Asperger's are more like individuals with autism than a separate standalone disorder. Additionally, in the new DSM-5, we did used to have um, three categories, so difficulties and social difficulties, communication impairments, and restrictive and repetitive, and now the social communication impairment. Those have both been folded into one. Um, and then we know that some children with social communication impairments don't have two or more types of repetitive or restrictive behavior difficulties. And so there's a separate diagnosis now called social communication disorder, which kind of is like the kiddos that may have qualified as a diagnosis of Asperger's, but most kiddos that did receive a diagnosis of Asperger's also still had some of this restrictive and repetitive, um, you know, patterns of behavior. And when we look at comparing the DSM-5 to the DSM-4, um, there are studies that have been done, and the results of these studies show that around 95% of those that received an autism spectrum diagnosis using the old DSM-4 criteria still receive an I, a diagnosis um, for, for, the, um, for autism spectrum disorder in the DSM-5. So again, everyone is still covered, so to speak. And then I want to leave you guys with this video about cure. So we know that there's not necessarily a biological cure for autism, but because early intervention is so powerful, um, a lot of kids, if we catch them early on and you've got um, some pretty good cognitive skills intact and maybe don't have a diagnosis of intellectual disability in addition, they can be, they can almost outgrow or be asymptomatic a little bit um, later in life. So I want to leave you guys with this video and just kind of think about this and what are your thoughts about saying you can cure autism? Um, how does this help or hurt the population? What are the implications of this for support planning? So just leave you guys with some food for thought. And I actually already have it here. Whoa. Apologies with that. You can now also watch the Tony Awards. Um, if you so desire, um, let me go back here. I had it pulled up so in case there was an ad, you guys wouldn't have to watch it, but. You think popular travel websites show you. You also get to watch an ad. Um, we'll wait for that ad. Um, but yeah, so think as you watch this video, what's the importance of, um, saying maybe we can cure or not cure something or that someone can outgrow their developmental disabilities diagnosis, just thinking about what a developmental disability is. Um, Kathy Lord is really an authority on this issue, so it's very interesting to hear her um, talk about this. This morning we're looking at two new studies of autism. One of them out this morning suggests that kids can outgrow the disorder or they get better because they were misdiagnosed. The other finds that changing autism standards could leave out thousands of patients. Dr. Catherine Lord is one of the experts working on these new autism guidelines, and she joins us now. Thank you, doctor. Uh, we were talking uh, during the break, and I was wondering if parents could be encouraged on one hand, but also angry on the other. Encouraged because you're thinking, phew, my child doesn't have autism. But angry on the other hand, if you're thinking, I know my child needs, needs help, but now they're saying, no, he's not that bad. He or she is not that bad. Can you, is it a good news, bad news kind of thing? I, I think it is. I mean, I think the combination of both this new study that's coming out in pediatrics, which suggests that there are people who get diagnoses of autism, and then when you ask their parents later, do they have it, the parents say no. So it is possible either that the diagnosis was wrong in the first place or that kids grow out of it. And not everyone who gets a diagnosis of autism necessarily continues to have it forever. 
On the other hand, I think there's been huge concern in response to the recent media um, about the redefining criteria right. and families being very, very concerned that their kids are going to lose their diagnoses. And I think it's really important to reassure people that there is no intention that that will happen. So even if, even if that changes, then you're saying there's, there's no intention. But if they do, in fact, uh, they're no, they no longer fall under the spectrum, the concern is that they will lose the benefits that many parents need for these children. Is that expected to change if they're already diagnosed? No, it's not. I mean, I think that the intention of the new criteria is to better describe children who have, and adults, mm -hmm. who have autism, Asperger syndrome, PDD-NOS, or anything with, that falls within that criteria. What we want to do is we don't want criteria that diagnose everyone as having autism. So we want to do a better job of diagnosing the people who do, but we're not trying to exclude anyone. Here's the question, what's so hard about diagnosing autism that you have these new studies uh, raising these questions? Well, I think the problem is that although autism is a neurobiological disorder, it has to do with brain function, the diagnosis is made purely on the basis of behavior. And it encompasses a huge range of skills. And as the pediatric study showed, also associated problems such as mental retardation or language delay. So we have to come up with descriptions for behavior that describe children and adults across development mm -hmm. and describe people who ha may have no speech at all up to very articulate, very bright people who also have the basic social deficits and other kinds of problems associated but is with there, autism. Is there a huge difference or divide within the scientific community about autism? I don't think so. I think that what we're trying to do is get better, faster, and more accurate in diagnoses, and the question is how to do that. Can you go back a little bit, can you go back to the, the statement you made about being able to outgrow autism? Because I got a very angry, angry email from a friend of mine who has a child who has autism saying that's just absolutely not true. How can you even put that on the air? So can you explain that a little bit more? What, well, I think it's two saying? different things. I think in the pediatric study, families were asked, has any health professional ever given you a said that your child might have autism, mm -hmm. and then ask, does your child have autism? Mm -hmm. So it's quite possible that in that study, someone said, maybe your child has autism, go see a specialist, and the parents did, and they didn't have autism. Mm -hmm. But there is a so let's small... talk about the kids that do right. have autism. Okay. Let's the, focus on that. Yeah. Can they outgrow it? There, there is a small proportion of kids with autism who do outgrow it. What percentage? I would say 10 to 20% of kids with autism without other severe problems. Does that mean they were misdiagnosed or something No, happened? I think they really get better. I mean, it is possible for kids to get better. And is but, that about the treatment? I mean, and, and, and in revising then the criteria for autism, does this re revise then the treatment? Well, I think that the, the revising criteria should not affect the treatment okay. because the treatments have to be based on the characteristics of the individual child. So what does a parent do? I think that a parent needs to, first of all, get a careful diagnosis. They need more than a brief office visit of someone saying your child looks autistic. And then I think you have to figure out what treatment makes sense for your child. Great to have you here today, Dr. Catherine Lord. Thanks for your time. All right, so there's just some food for thought. I hope you guys have really enjoyed learning about autism. If anything is unclear, like always, please let me know. I'm more than happy to help. And I really hope you enjoy watching the documentary Autism the Musical.